Good Friday afternoon to you. Four o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Hope your weekend is off to a great start. So yesterday we heard Browns had uh, restructured Nick Chubb's contract, which we expected. He can earn all of it back with um, incentives that are now in the deal. Uh, Jake Trotter, ESPN, talked about um, what he thinks Nick Chubb's role will be with Browns in 2024. This is from ESPN Cleveland. This is what I think Nick Chubb's role is going to be. I think it's going to be very similar to what we saw from Kareem Hunt this past season, at least at the start, which, you know, that, that might feel underwhelming, but the guy's coming off two major knee surgeries. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And I'm not betting against Nick Chubb because if anybody can overcome the odds, it's him. But I think everybody needs to uh, temper their expectations uh, of what he's going to look like Again, that Jake, Jake Trotter, ESPN's Browns beat reporter. Let's welcome in Brad Ward from the Orange and Brown Report, All Eyes on Cleveland podcast. Um, what do you think realistic expectations are? I, I know you've addressed this on the All Eyes on Cleveland podcast. Yeah, we talked at it length last night, and we had uh, Dr. Jesse Morse on, a uh, you know uh, sports medicine, regenerative medicine uh, doctor that we always have on the show. And, he his expectations are for him to be back at towards the beginning of the season. Um, I agree with Jake here that naturally I want to temper my expectations a little bit. Now, it's it's Nick Chubb, right? He's superhuman, and by all accounts, he's attacking this rehab in that way. So, you you never know, right? Uh, but I do think uh, to to Jake's point there. Um, I don't know about a Kareem Hunt role, but I, I think that he will be eased back into things. And then ideally, you would see him start to trust that leg a little bit more, trust the knee a little bit more on cuts and things like that as you get into December uh, and into the playoffs, right? That's the ideal scenario is the the target date really, I don't for me, wouldn't be anything in the regular season that would be we expect to be a postseason team. Let's have him ready uh, to maybe carry it 10 to 12 times in the postseason. Well, and, you know, they monitored his carries to begin with. You, you remember, people were all upset that they weren't giving it to him 30, yeah. 35 times. So they're going to monitor those carries even more early in the year. I, you know, the, the, the thing that... Nick Chubb didn't have a lot of explosion, and we found out after the season he was hurt, so that's one of the reasons. I think he's probably going to have a little bit more explosiveness even coming off of an injury. Yeah, he, it's very possible, right, with uh, everything and the reconstruction and all that. Uh, what we find out with these knee injuries a lot of times is – and a lot of it's mental too. It, the biggest thing is trust. So that that's where you can't like with Nick Chubb. He's such a specimen that he may have a, a totally different mental approach than some other players that have recovered from similar injuries. But you see guys come back, kind of reacclimate to the game speed, and then oftentimes you see them more back to themselves in the following year. So like 2025, right? Um, I hope my hopes are that you know 80 90 percent of nick chubb which is better than most right uh is there for them late in the season and uh he does gain some of that explosion back um and uh and he feels confident cutting on the leg as they had delayed in the season but as far as i just you know they're going to ease him in right it's going to be running back by committee um you know, there's some misnomers about this offense. This offense is still going to run the football, Dave. I mean, mm -hmm. the coaches they brought in are run first guys. They're still going to run the ball. Just because they're spread out more doesn't mean they're not going to run it. No, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, so Deshaun Watson on his um, QB Unplugged podcast with Quincy Avery, his quarterback coach, uh, this one just dropped a little bit ago, was talking about the new coaching staff on the offensive side of the Brown, uh, ball for the Browns. Uh, I'm super excited about Doris and Reese um, and Deuce. Um, I feel like I'm missing somebody else. Um, but um, all the new additions that we have on, on the offensive side, because, you know, we have different minds, guys that's been in different locations and different offices, offenses 
so they can bring to this offense with the type of talent and the type of guys that we have. So uh, super excited about there with the offense looking a little bit different than before. Uh, there's a chance, uh, definitely. Uh, you ain't going to give them too yeah, much? <laughs> not too much. So, you know, we're we building, uh, you know, the offensive scheme that's going to be best for, you know, the 2024 Cleveland offense. So, uh, you know, that's all we can really speak on with that one. And, Brad, I would expect that offense to look different, uh, pretty substantially different. It, it, some elements will be the same as we talked about earlier. They're still going to run the football, um, but it will be very different. I think they're going to be more spread out. Yeah, spread. Uh, I mean, you know, his comment about making it best for the 2024 Browns is really about him, right? It's getting him in a position where he's the most comfortable um, and he has made it clear that he's most comfortable in a spread scenario where he can view things. And, you know, the one name he does not mention there is Nick Charlton, and, and he is coming from a background of where they really dressed up those offenses, right, like with uh, motion. And it was almost egregious how far down on the uh, – when you have a direct correlation between motion and shifts – and offensive offensive success, and then you don't use it to twenty to the tune of twenty eighth ranked in the league. Uh, that needs to change, right? And I think that's something that we're going to see a lot of. Andy Dickerson as well uh, going to play a role in pairing that motion with the run game. Um, you know, it's interesting. Somebody on my show last night said this. You know, Stefanski made the comment at the uh, uh, owners' meetings. He was asked about the motion thing, and he was like. Yeah, well, we don't just want to run motion for no reason. Well, well, you kind of do, actually, you know. You, you actually really do want to run motion for no reason sometimes because it just unfolds the defense, and, it, it you know, it allows – if you're doing it properly, it allows your wide receivers to out-leverage guys before the play even starts. So, used properly, yeah, you do want to run it even, for, uh, you know, for no reason. So, yeah. And, again, <clears throat> I would expect motion. I would expect RPO. I would expect spread. And out of the spread – that just means you're giving your running backs more room to run. Yeah, the adjustment there is the shotgun run, right? Like, so uh, it, you'll be in the gun a lot. They've got to figure that out. I think they have the guys to do that with some more inside zone stuff, um, some more gap scheme and things like that. But, uh, you know, when running from the shotgun, it's a, it's a little bit different, right? And, and, uh, and even Nick Chubb was going through an adjustment period with that. Uh, so... You you want to see the run game be effective out of the shotgun, and and that's something that in the second half of last year, Dave, they didn't really do very well. If you recall, at the end of games, they were winning all the time, and they couldn't salt the way the game as they had in the past with the four minute drive or whatever. It felt like they were always needing to throw the ball, regardless, right? Uh, that is what they need to be able to get back to. Is hey, if we have a lead, we can lean on the run game, run it. 10, 12 times in the second half and, and put a team away. So um, this is an interesting graph. So these are turnover-worthy play rate when pressured versus when not pressured. Um, and, and, you know, you, you look at it, and um, the closer you are to the right corner, the better. Deshaun Watson is on the right, and Joe Flacco is more towards the left. So you, you see Joe Flacco, and he's in the Will Levis, Daniel Jones territory. Um, X-axis, turnover-worthy play rate when not pressured. Y-axis, turnover-worthy play, play rate when pressured. So um, Watson's in the Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins, we take care of the ball realm. And Joe Flacco, Daniel Jones, Will Levis, you know, Bailey Zappi. To uh, so, <laughs> not all not all turnovers are created equal, and, and when you look at that, yeah. that's one of the reasons they decided to move on from Joe Flacco. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know Deshaun off schedule is tremendous, right? And that's why the under pressure number is so good there, um, and because uh, he can create, right? Um, and even in some of going back to watch some of last season when he was playing, um, there are some good signs, really good signs of him manipulating the pocket and stepping up and doing some timing stuff. Even the play they went over with Stefanski on the podcast that they do at QB Unplugged last week was a good uh, example of that. Um, so 
I have high hopes. Again, uh, you know, uh, I, people may call me crazy, but I have high hopes for Deshaun. Um, you know, I watch every, I, I think this podcast was there to help his public image, but also make him more accessible to a Cleveland Browns fan base. And he's done that. He seems comfortable in his own skin. Uh, he speaks intelligently about the game like he always has. So I do have high hopes for him. All right. Uh, this from BVM Sports, key offseason storylines for the Browns um, in the offseason program. Attention on Deshaun Watson's recovery and readiness for the upcoming season. Um, you see Jerry Judy's integration into the team and the impact on the offense under scrutiny. Uh, tackle situation, three potential starters, two spots. It's an intriguing lineup dynamic and uncertainty surrounding the primary play calling position between Stefanski and Dorsey. Um, <clears throat> start, we'll start with Watson. You know, that the one thing about it, you know, we've tried. We couldn't find anybody who has had a fractured glenoid bone in his shoulder that was a quarterback in the NFL. So he's, he's breaking ground coming back from that, and I'm not sure that you necessarily want to be the first to do that. Is it going to be called Deshaun Watson surgery at some point, like Tommy John surgery? It's a, it's a great point, uh, and uh, it's a devastating injury uh, by all accounts, but from, from everything that we're hearing, he's very confident about his recovery and the people around him are too. So... Uh, not that we would hear anything else at this point, but at least it's refreshing to hear. Yes, it's going to take him some time to reacclimate, uh, but I think uh, I, I wish he wouldn't have thrown week one out there. It's like, that, you know, hey, I'll be back week one and I'll be back better than ever. Uh, sometimes those things are a little maybe just leave that to just just prove it on the field. But that's OK, too. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's all about Deshaun, right? Like this roster's loaded. One through 53, they are uh, maybe the best roster in the NFL. Uh, you got to get the quarterback right. Now, he was 5-1 and one playing not his best football last year, so it does give you a little bit of leeway, I think, Dave. Yeah, and without question. And the, the other thing is it's a bone. Bones tend to heal quicker um, than ligaments or tendons or any of those things so uh relative to jerry judy if they find if they get jerry judy incorporated in here and can quote unquote unlock him i think this offense can be what kevin stefanski thinks it can be um you can see deshaun's excitement about what they're going to be doing with the offense in that lat in the clip we saw uh i think kevin feels the same way uh, it kind of comes off of him when he's talking about it as well. Uh, and Jerry Judy is a part of that, right? Like his ability uh, to play out of the slot and outside, but probably going to use him a lot in the slot uh, if, if they're used, doing it right, you know, and, and get Elijah Moore outside. And, and uh, I, I think that he's going to be a uh, – has the potential to be a, a difference maker in the, this offense as adding a weapon that they just haven't had there, right? Um, can break a big play at any moment, create separation a lot, uh, very good route runner, um, just pairing another weapon there. Uh, it's a weapons race. The AFC is a weapons race. The AFC is loaded, uh, but it's always a weapons race. And I, and I think that Jerry Judy can actually – to your to use your term unlocked I, I think they will unlock it i think they i think that uh kevin has a good I idea of how he wants to use him and what he's going to do with him you know relative to three tackles for two positions i'd rather have three tackles than one tackle um but but it is getting that right is i mean that's that's going to be a challenge for them well, I don't know what they're going to do, David. That's the puzzling thing there, right? Like, uh, do you want to try to DeWan to left tackle? Probably want to try it out a little bit, just even to see for next year what you're going to be. I mean, you have to have a plan for the draft, too, to draft forward for an offensive lineman, right? Um, uh, looking forward. So maybe you want to try him out at left tackle in OTAs and camp. We'll see. I'm sure we'll hear rumblings of that if that's what's going on. Um, and then the other thing, though, that they could do, which I, I kind of suspect that might give them a little bit of wiggle room as far as it's concerned, because I don't think you want it. Sitting down to Juan Jones is not good for anybody. Um, but sitting down a $14 million tackle isn't great either, Dave. Uh, so 
I think that maybe they'll ease Jack Conklin in and put the injury tag around him. Like, hey, we're kind of bringing him back in. He's not fully ready yet from the injury last year. He's still kind of easing his way back in. And maybe that gives them some leeway to start DeWan Jones and uh, see how things go from there. And the last part of that, uh, the play calling. I have no issues whatsoever with Kevin Stefanski's play calling. But if he wants to give it over to Ken Dorsey, okay. Yeah, to me, Ken Dorsey is like the uh, the super quarterbacks coach, a.k.a. offensive coordinator. I'm sure he's got a lot of input in the offense. But uh, to me, this is still Stefanski's offense to call. Uh, I feel pretty strongly about that. I, I would be a little shocked if they do it. But like you, I won't uh, protest if they do it. They to do it. Brad Ward from the Orange and Brown Report, the All Eyes on Cleveland podcast. Now I can step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, turn our attention a little bit more to the upcoming draft. Just a couple of weeks away, Sports for CLE. We'll be right back talking Browns and draft. Play Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery, and you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. We continue talking Browns with Brad Ward from the Orange and Brown Report and the All Eyes on Cleveland podcast. So uh, I know you wrote uh, another one of your articles for the Orange and Brown Report, things you think you know about the Browns. Um, Positions of focus in the draft. Let's tackle that one first. Uh, well, you said it, uh, tackle, right? And guard. Uh, I mean, listen, not going to make a lot of fans really super excited, but um, you are in a transition period, and, and even uh, Andrew Berry talked about it, looking forward, right, with his draft. He, he's not drafting for this year necessarily. He's drafting for the future. And in this situation, you need to find a tackle and potentially a guard because Joe Batonio is not going to play forever um, to fill in this offensive line that, let's face it, Dave has had a ton of money sunk into it for years and years and years, and you are moving a lot of money to wide receiver and other positions. And in order for this to work and for the roster build to be uh, easier on Barry to manage, um, it's just going to be easier if you can go into 2025 with Dewan Jones and another guy on a rookie contract starting at your tackle position. Think of how refreshing that would be for their ability to build the roster and flexibility there to spend on other positions instead of sinking, uh, you know, upwards of 12 to $15 million on almost every position on the offensive line. Same thing at guard. Joe Batoni is not going to play forever. I think he's coming close to the end here in the next couple of years. So you also got to look at the guard position. I think that they like the guys they have on the roster. I don't think they think any of them are the future of that position. So once again, in the draft, my focus, not just on this, but my main area of focus would be trying to get a future starting tackle if possible and somewhere in the draft addressing guard as well. So let's um, combine the next two that uh, from the same article. Trade possibilities for the draft as well as late round draft strategy. Yeah, you know, the trade possibilities for me, it's highly likely that they trade back. David. How, I mean, it's just going to be so hard for them. At least it would be hard for me. Maybe I'm putting myself in issues. But Andrew's a patient man, uh, I guess. If you sit at 85 and wait all the way till the fifth round, that is a ton of good players coming off the board there, right? And then by the time you come back in the fifth round, who knows what's left, um, and it is a little bit thinner of a draft. So uh, that leads us to uh, you know our late round strategy, which, listen, there are still really good players there. But there's a reason they're being picked at that point, right? So it's either off the field, you know, level of competition, uh, their size maybe, like they're, you know, too big for the position or in between positions or too small for the position. But if you know what you want, right? Like, for example, if the Browns know what they want in uh, this next wide receiver they're going to take, just for a random example, 
They want a good route runner that's going to, you know, stretch the field horizontally or whatever. You can find that anywhere in the draft. Like, the the complete players are gone by that point. But you can find guys with elite traits there. They're just going to be really good at one thing or another. So understanding what you need for your roster and attacking that, you can still find really good value, as we've seen them do with guys like Dewan Jones later in the draft. Yeah, the, they've been – Andrew Barry has been – Pretty good to really good at that, you know. I mean, you look at even even a guy like Donovan Peoples-Jones in the sixth round. He yes. still gave you four, three and a half, four productive years in the league. Um, this one from your burning questions, uh, burning Browns questions, Orange and Brown report. Do you think they should draft a tight end? Yeah, I, I think it's a possibility. It depends on who's there, right? So uh, there are – it's an – very interesting tight end draft. It's not great, but there's some intriguing players there like Jaheim Bell. Jatavia Sanders, of course, would be the dream there if you wanted. But, like, still, none of those guys are really in-line tight ends. And you're kind of duplicating what you already have with Jordan Akins. Now, if you're going to say that I'm going to take Jaheim Bell and, and get rid of Jordan Akins, then that's fine. And then add another guy uh, at tight end to be your tight end three, but the hole in the roster right now is just tight end three for me, right? Um, and that needs to be a guy that can block and catch passes. So uh, you can find those guys later in the draft too. Absolutely. Would you be surprised if they took a running back somewhere around two through four? I would be uh, a little bit. Um, I think there's some really talented guys there. I just don't see – who knows? You know, he's put himself in a position where he's checked all the boxes, right? So he can take whatever he feels like he wants. But I would be a little bit surprised if they go that early because I think they're of the philosophy that uh, late-round draft pick, priority UDFA, you can get guys with uh, similar traits – uh, to come in and, uh, get, you know, challenge for a position on the roster. All right, so we do know that um, they've had a couple more wide receivers in um, for their 30 visits. Uh, Georgia wide receiver Lad McConkey in Atlanta today. He visited the Browns recently. Um, Atlanta's one of the teams to do in-person work with McConkey. Projected late first, early second round that from Ian Rapport. Franklin, the kid from Oregon, has also been in. We know Corley has been in. Um, they are definitely doing their due diligence on wide receivers. Uh, absolutely. The most realistic, I think, is Corley. Um, I think Lad McConkey will be off the board by the time they draft. Uh, he may be a first-round draft pick, Dave. Um, but, you know, they are doing their due diligence. And, uh, I, I suspect that of the top 30 visits, and we only have, you know, what, uh, 20 of them in the name so far, so uh, that there'll be a couple more wide receivers in there as well. So um, Troy Franklin is interesting, right? Uh, he, he wouldn't be my pick personally, um, but, but he certainly stretches the field and brings that speed uh, that you might want to. Uh, that they seem to, that, that's one thing they're missing is somebody that can take the top off, right? Uh, straight line speed guy, deep ball guy. So uh, it wouldn't shock me if they took him. But if they're going that route, uh, there are some other guys that I would favor. All right. Um, you have written an article, Five Sleepers in the 2024 Draft. Um, we'll run through them, then we can talk a little bit about them. Uh, Malik Washington, wide receiver from Virginia. Jalen Corker, uh, wide receiver, Holy Cross. Muhammad Kamara, edge rusher, Colorado State. Tip Ryman, tight end from Illinois. And Kristen Boyd, defensive lineman, Northern Iowa. Who um, Of those, who do you like? You got to dig deep for some of these, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, what makes a sleeper, right? That that same thing we were talking about with value in the later rounds, right? Um, they're smaller than than the average person at that position, uh, or they uh, are in between, or they played at a small school, and that's kind of where what this list, uh, it you know, derives from. My favorite guy on the list is Malik Washington. So. Uh, I love love his game. He's 5'8". Uh, that's going to scare some teams off, but, man, the guy can run routes. He's so sudden, so quick. Um, I think he would be, you know, 
when you're building that that diverse uh, wide receiver room where you want guys that can all do different stuff, they don't have anybody like Malik Washington, and, and he can be a real threat. So uh, I like him a lot. Uh, Coker is a bigger kid. He's a powerful receiver. He played a Holy Cross. So there's going to be your questions about competition. Um, tip Tip Roman is Roman Romain. I, I don't. Either way, uh, he played at Illinois, but he is a huge kid. I mean, we're talking 6'5", 271, really good blocker and surprisingly smooth in his route running, right, uh, in the short to intermediate. So maybe that's a late-round option at tight end because he can block really well and be kind of a security blanket at tight end for you uh, with the potential to even be more uh, massive man. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that, uh, is a potential too. Um, I like him as a potential option for them at tight end, as we were talking about before. The other guy I would mention is Boyd from, uh, the last guy in Northern Iowa, who is six four three seventeen. But if you're talking about, um, not a huge fan of taking defensive tackles, as I've talked about before on your show, Dave, but, uh, here's a guy with a lot of explosion reminds me a little bit of Michael Hall. Uh, like Michael, Michael Hall light, maybe. Um, and uh, uh, he's bigger than Hall, um, but just as explosive as, get, as getting up field. And once again, the question is level of competition. Uh, huge snub from the um, – played great at the Senior Bowl and was snubbed from the Combine. So, interesting. All right. Um, this is from NFL.com. Most underrated prospect in this year's NFL draft. Mark Ross says Xavier Leggett, wide receiver, South Carolina. 6'1", 221-pound wideout, plays physical and fast, 43940. Outstanding ball skills. He has kick return ability that adds more value to his stock in the league's new rules. To me, his talent is comparable with the better-known receivers who will get picked early in round one. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. I, I don't I, I don't know enough about him from what I've seen. He, he's a big guy that can run fast. I mean, make it make sense, Dave. Like, why why is he so undervalued, or why isn't he higher on lists? I don't get it. He has everything that most of these receivers have. Uh, He's right. He's underrated, but I just don't understand why he's underrated. I haven't found a reason for him to be underrated. He has the whole package as far as I'm concerned. Let me ask you this before I let you go. Who would you consider, uh, if the Browns can get this guy, you know, because we know they're drafting either later in the second round or, heck, they may trade to the third, who is a guy that, that if they come away with this guy, I'm pretty happy? Uh, there's a couple names, right? I, I think Corley is on that list. I would be really happy if they took Corley uh, as in the wide receiver realm. But, you know, I've talked a lot about the offensive line and many need moving for uh, Kingsley, Sua Mataya, um, uh, Roger Rosengarten. Uh, those are two guys I think are at the uh, – there's kind of a cliff drop-off after them. Uh, those guys I think are of the starting pedigree tackle – uh, at the next level. So if you got one of them uh, at 54 or 85, I would be happy. I would be really happy. Brad Ward, uh, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Brad. You're the best, Dave. Thank you for having me, sir. Brad Ward, make sure you check him out. Really good stuff. Uh, Orange and Brown Report. He is also the host of the All Eyes on Cleveland podcast. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, Lance Reisland from The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com. Film breakdown, video analysis of three linebackers that Lance thinks fits Jim Schwartz's scheme. That's straight ahead on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. Come back to Go Forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin.
We continue talking Browns on Sports 4 CLE. Time to take a look at another position group um, for the upcoming NFL Draft uh, film breakdown video analysis. Whenever we do that, welcome in Lance Reisland from The Plain Dealer as well as Cleveland.com. Lance, today we are looking at linebackers, um, and we're going to start with a guy that um, I, I know you like. We've talked about him before, uh, Peyton Wilson, six foot four. 233-pounder from North Carolina State. What do you like about him? Uh, well, I've made it very clear. He's uh, he's my uh, he's definitely my guy in the draft. You know, it, sometimes you watch the film, uh, and I always try to base my stuff on the film. And what you see on the film matches what you get uh, when you watch. You know, when you see his numbers at the combine, and uh, he's just a guy who's relentless. You know, he's a guy who ran a 443, 34 and a half inch vert. He's got a hundred and uh, you know 119 broad broad jump he's player of the year he's a buckus he's been eric but more than that he's just relentless in everything he does and i think about the browns defense and you're going to see him here he comes off the edge beats the guard on you know he plays he's playing a true end now you're going to see him coming on a blitz and he actually gets knocked down and gets back up he's got great spatial awareness he's got great body control he has the ability to move in space that football speed he has as you'll see here that football speed he has carries over to the foot uh to the field more than some track guys who run fast he's a very fast football player as well uh, he's mean. He's nasty. Uh, I, again, I think he fits the Swartz uh, scheme perfect because he can play inside, outside. He had 138 tackles this year, uh, six sacks, three interceptions, plays all over the field. Uh, made no doubts. This is my, uh, without question, my favorite breakdown of the year. And I'm, I'm, I'm a lot of breakdowns in, and this guy's uh, my favorite to watch. Yeah, the, the one thing that um, is concerning relative to the Browns' uh, age, but but again, I've said I think this year because of the draft eligible guys are older just because you have the extra year of eligibility. NIL is keeping a lot of the underclassmen in. So I, I'm curious to see if they tweak their uh, age guardrails. Well, yeah, and he's also, you know, he had some injuries early on in his career. Uh, you know, I would say this for some of the guys that, you know, that I like. Uh, and it sounds kind of weird, but they're almost too physical. And when you're too physical and you fly around like you do, it's hard to stay healthy. And a lot of these guys who fly around like they do, uh, they're just too big, too fast, too, uh, you know, too powerful to play like that sometimes in the NFL. It's a long season. Uh, that would be my concern for him. Uh, age doesn't bother me in terms of because I think he can play right away. He's not a guy you have to develop. So if you get a guy who's 22 and you have to develop him for a while and play him when he's 24, I don't think Peyton Wilson has to uh, be developed. You know, my friend Todd Goble is the uh, – uh, play with me in college. He's the uh, special teams coach, and I got a talk, uh, chance to talk to him this week and, you know, confirm what a special player and special person Peyton Wilson really is. All right, another guy that we're looking at whose name has been associated in mock drafts with uh, the Browns linebacker, Junior Colson, six foot two, 238 pounds out of the University of Michigan. So two things I like about him. So first of all, he's the, he was probably the best player on the best defense in the country. Uh, he was the vocal leader. Uh, he plays mean, relentless, and, and it almost looked like he looks irritated. And I remember my dad always telling my linebackers, I want you to be irritated. And, and it kind of makes me laugh. But he's very instinctive, very explosive. He's another four or five guy. Uh, he's position flexible. He can play inside or outside. He avoids traffic, which I really like. So he has the ability to get through and avoid traffic and kind of get skinny when he's coming through the gap. And he's a fantastic open field tackler. You're going to see here on a quick screen, going back, you're going to see him coming out of blitz. It's obviously something he would do with Schwartz. He's got a great short area. Now you're going to see him react to his screen. Um, he has no wasted time when he's reacting. He sees it, he pulls the trigger, and he goes. And he runs very, very well. Again, he plays angry. Uh, a guy who moves very well. And a guy, again, who's 238 pounds. So you got two guys here that are bigger than what the Browns have. It can play that mic, play that inside, and take on guards. And, um, but also guys that can run and be flexible with Jim Schwartz wants. Yeah, and the size is important because of fit with the Browns. You're already undersized with Jeremiah Usukoromo. I think we both think he's going to get extended. So the guys you bring in better be a little bit bigger than him. Well, yeah, and you have to make sure that you, you adjust to the scheme, right? So it's a one-gap penetrating scheme, which means sometimes uh, you're going to get guys who run free to the linebackers. They're not always taking on two guys. So these guys have to be big. They have to be strong. They have to be fast. Uh, you're, you're doing your best to try to make sure the JOK is free. And sometimes you have to do that by taking on a running back or a fullback or a tight end with the right shoulder 
and turn it back into JOK. Those defensive linemen have to get upfield. It's a very team-oriented defense from level one to level two to level three. The second-level guys, I don't even consider them linebackers. I consider them second-level guys because they have to do so much. Uh, Jim Schwartz, second-level guys and safeties have to be really elite players with really elite knowledge of the, uh, the game of football. Um, again, Colson, great player on a great defense. Uh, enjoyed watching him play last couple years. Uh, Buckeye fans, uh, Buckeye fans will remember him well. All right, uh, the third guy that we're going to look at, linebacker Chris Braswell, six foot three, two hundred and fifty-one pounds, so even bigger, uh, from Alabama, played for Nick Saban. So you're going to, so this guy's a little bit different, right? So he had fifty-four QB pressures, thirteen sacks this year. He run, he plays the run just as well. Uh, he's a great scheme fit, and I'll go over that here in a second. But he's an athletic freak kind of kid. He's a four point six forty. Um, he's got an uh, eight, just under 81-inch wingspan, a 1.59 uh, 10-yard split, which I love, 33-inch vert, 115 broad jump, 705 squat, 405 clean. So he's one of these incredibly gifted athletes. Now, he's a little bit different than the first two. He's a guy who's going to play on the edge, play a little bit more of the outside back. But he's a guy who I've seen in coverage. He's a guy that I've also seen down inside at the tackle. So very flexible at 251 pounds. Here, you're going to see him playing the true defensive end, and, and he sets the edge very well. Uh, on the first clip here, you're going to see him. He goes from a club to a rip to a straight arm, uh, a long arm technique for a sack. Again, going back to this first one, you're going to see him set the edge. He extends. He's very strong. He has very violent hands. So as compared to the first two who are more middle linebackers who could do a lot of things, this is a versatile guy who can play some end, some tackle uh, in the nickel defense. I think he can also drop. He doesn't, doesn't drop to um, be a lineman in coverage. He drops with athleticism. He drops with knowledge and, and understanding what teams are trying to do. This guy is a very, very good athlete uh, on a very good defense. Really liked his film. A uh, little bit different, like I said, than the first two guys, but in a short scheme, the ability to play more positions and be aggressive and be mean and be relentless, uh, those things are important. And this Braswell kid, I really liked on film. Uh, I'm starting to like him more and more as I watch more and more of him. When you look at scheme fit for uh, for Schwartz defense, what are some of the things that you need to see? What are some of the characteristics that if you're going to get a guy to play in this um, at second level of this defense, what do they need to have? Well, the second level guys are really interesting guys. You can put the safeties in there as well because if one of the safeties comes down, so they have to be able to run fit. So they're going if they get a big tight two tight end set or a 12 personnel, 13 personnel, or even you know 21 personnel, they need to be able to fill. C and D gap. So they need to be run stoppers like linebackers. They need to cover in space. They need to cover tight ends. They need to cover backs. Uh, they need to make sure that they're able to uh, handle different situations with different formations. Uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a safety, you need to be able to go back and forth. But these second level guys, they need to be able to blitz from different spots. Um, you name it. In a game of football, the second level as a linebacker and a safety, these second level guys have to do it. They have to be incredibly versatile, hybrid guys that can play. Uh, play the run, play the pass, play in coverage, blitz from different spots, take on defenders. It's a dynamic group, and when you get great players, you get what you had last year, a, dy a dynamic bunch that can make a bunch of plays behind the line of scrimmage. The other thing that, that jumps out to me, they better be able to tackle in space because your, your, your linemen are getting upfield. That means anything that gets by them, that second level better stop them. Yeah, and that goes into it too. So right there's another there's another responsibility at second level. So you're gonna get a lot of, and a lot of times you have to do things. The defensive linemen in this defense are turned free and turned loose. And what that does is it screws up uh, blocking schemes up front. So a lot of times they get to run free. And when you're running free, you have to make tackles. So with the pressure the Browns bring, a lot of offense will get rid of the ball quick or try to set the edge. So these guys have to get there, they have to tackle well. In the few uh, circumstances last year when they didn't do that. You saw them get exposed a little bit. So, you know, they need to create pressure so the secondary can play well. The secondary plays well, you know, if the defensive line plays well. The defensive line plays well, the secondary plays well. The defensive line is doing their job, then the defense, uh, you know, that second level linebackers have to tackle very well. It's a very team oriented defense. It's a very simple defense. It's not hard to break down. It's not hard to scout. It's get lined up, understand your rule, play with your hair on fire, tackle and play with passion and it's really simple be really really fundamentally sound uh and play and and that's what jim schwartz wants and when you do that you play fast lance roslin as always great stuff appreciate the time and the insight thanks very much lance
As always, thanks for having me. Lance Rosman, always insightful video analysis, film breakdown. Uh, make sure you check him out not only on our show, but in the pages of The Plain Dealer as well as on Cleveland.com. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as Academic All-Stars and Teachers of the Month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K-12. Is your K-12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns on Sports 4 CLE. This next one from uh, Yardbarker.com, and it's ranking the next five-year windows for each of the NFL teams. So they say uh, the best is the Chiefs, uh, second best 49ers, third Eagles, fourth Ravens, sixth Bengals. They have the Browns 14th, um, so middle of the pack. Deshaun Watson's injury has set back Cleveland again. Though their success with Joe Flacco shows the talented roster, the roster doesn't have much maneuverability due to Watson's contract, and the recent drafts have been mixed bags. The defense has plenty invested in excellent veterans like Miles, Garrett, Denzel Ward, and Zadarius Smith. Uh, let's welcome in Randy Gersey from Dog Pound Daily. And Randy, I, um, I just don't see what they're thinking with this. Um, Watson's contract has two more years after this, so it, it isn't even half of that five-year window. Um, and the Bengals, who they have ranked sixth, still have to pay Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, and they're probably going to lose one of those. So I, I, I get the whole narrative about Deshaun Watson's contract has limited maneuverability. Andrew Barry and the Browns have done anything they've wanted to do in part because Jimmy Haslam is Jimmy Haslam is just writing checks. Yeah, we've been hearing for the last couple of years now that the Browns are just, you know, cap strapped, can't sign anybody, can't do anything, yet they continue to do whatever they feel like doing. They just signed uh, Jerry Judy to more than nineteen million dollars per season. So I, I don't, you know, I don't understand where, you know, his his contract is holding them back right now. And um I, I, I agree with you. I don't understand how you go from the number two seed with your starting quarterback out to all of a sudden you're the 14th best team in the NFL with your starting quarterback on the roster. So, I mean, I think I think it's what you said. It's the narrative. As long as Deshaun Watson's on the team, people are going to be trying to, to bring them down a little bit. The other thing is, if you think about it, I, I don't – now, Watson's contract isn't great. But the other ones, I mean, Ward, he's been injured, so maybe. Garrett, I mean, he's, he's not even a top five at that position anymore, and he won Defensive Player of the Year. Um, Mari Cooper, I don't – there isn't a contract where you're like, man, that was, that was bad. There isn't one of those, really. No, and even the Deshaun Watson contract, the issue that everybody has with it is the fact that it's fully guaranteed. It's not the average per year. The average per year is right on par with other quarterbacks. Um, you know, you're starting to see some that are trickling in and making more than he is. So the big issue that everybody has there is the full guarantee. But guaranteed money, uh, signing bonuses, all that is easier to maneuver uh, when you have an owner like Jimmy Haslam who writes the big checks and is able to spread it out for multiple years. Yeah, and, and – um... The other thing, that, and I keep saying this, and I'll continue to say it, the reason they fully guaranteed the contract was that was going to be what made Deshaun Watson say, yep, I'm coming to Cleveland. Yeah, and they act like uh, the Browns were the only ones that were in, in this uh, negotiation with him. There was, uh, I believe it was 13 teams that were trying to trade for him, so they kind of had to get an edge up, and they gave him a fully guaranteed contract, the same thing the Minnesota Vikings did uh, to get Kirk Cousins, and it wasn't a problem when they did it. So uh, it's what the Browns had to do. Um, it is what it is. I also don't understand why people are so upset about players getting fully guaranteed money. We're, we're paying to watch the players. We're going to watch the players. 
on the field. Uh, so I don't know why everyone's so worried about protecting the owner's pockets. Yeah, and, and the flip side of it is, is the football contracts are the ones that aren't guaranteed, or, and those are the guys that take a beating week in and week out, more so than, than any others. Those are the guys that are, that are putting their bodies on the line in every game. Yeah, and we're supposed to feel like they're the ones who are being greedy when they want to get paid for that risk that they're taking. So, um, again, I think the issue is who got the guaranteed contract. But when you look at it, again, uh, compared to other quarterbacks, uh, he's not the first one to get a fully guaranteed in his average per year is in line with everybody else. So this one from the Bleach Report, every team's most underpaid value, uh, underpaid player uh, relative to the value. They go Browns, Jeremiah Usu-Koromoa. 2021 second-round pick broke out with 101 tackles, 3.5 sacks, two pick six passes defended in a Pro Bowl 2023 campaign um, and will cost the Browns just $2.1 million the final year of his rookie contract in 2024. You could say that about any player that is on their rookie deal that has the kind of year Koromoa did, but uh, yeah, he's a value and, and they're going to pay him. He's going to get a contract. Yeah, and you could look at uh, Patrick Queens probably as a good uh, kind of a focal point for where he's going to be. I think he, it was three years, $41 million, uh, nearly just a little over 13 and a half million per year. That's probably a safe bet to think that uh, JOK is going to get that. I mean, he was absolutely phenomenal. He was good in the first two years, but once that defensive line got a little stronger and was able to open a few holes for him, you really saw that athleticism uh, take over. And, and he was just uh, all over the field, 20 tackles for a loss, just absolutely phenomenal player. So you're right. He's going to get paid and it's going to be a lot of money. Yeah. And, and um, quite frankly, the, the defense that Jim Schwartz, the, the system, showcases his abilities because it's okay the the defensive linemen get upfield and then linebackers and safeties you guys clean everything up and a guy that can run fast and and tackle in space like JOK can he's he's going to show off in that system he is him and Grant Delpit both are just absolutely unstoppable uh under Jim Schwartz and he, like the uh, the San Francisco game uh JOK just kind of took over at the end where he was just it didn't matter what they tried to do he was reading the the screen passes stuff on the run so a guy like that just not only is he going to get paid he absolutely deserves it so um, this one from Sharp Football Analytics. Key stats and notes on the Browns entering the NFL draft. So gain 20 or more yards on 5.2 of their offensive plays. That ranks 23rd in the league. Jedrick Wills allowed 9.5% pressure rate and pass protection. 35th out of 38 qualified left tackles. Now, he was banged up part of the year, most of the year, so that, but that needs to be better. Ranked 29th in third and long with a 26.5% of set downs leading to third and long. That's seven or more yards. Uh, allowed 10 or more rushing yards on 13.7% of running back attempts. That was uh, 32nd. Uh, so that's um, something they need to work on as well. And when failing to make contact at or behind the line of scrimmage, they allowed 8.7 yards per attempt to running backs again, 37. So uh, allowed too many big running plays, and that's, um, you know, that's something that they need to address, obviously. I, I also think second year in a – let's remember, that's first year they were playing Jim Schwartz defense. Second year in a defense, there should be – there should be improvement. I, there's no other way to say it. There should be. Um, you also have to take into consideration that they they were on the field a lot last year. You had, you know, kind of going back to some of those third down uh, stats on their offense, um, not having a whole lot of big plays. Well, you had 10 games based essentially with Joe Flacco and Deshaun Watson, and then you had another seven games with P.J. Walker, Dorian Thompson Robinson. So your offense wasn't really moving the ball a whole lot. They weren't keeping the ball a lot. Um, so the defense was out on the field a lot, and they're also a very aggressive defense. You know, you get those, you know, 20 tackles for a loss with JOK, like we just talked about. Well, sometimes when you're that aggressive, it, it, it helps, you know, the other team might get a big play. Um, and I think sometimes you have to live with that. And thankfully, it wasn't, you know, the story of the season. It just happened, you know, occasionally. But overall, the defense played really well. I do think that they'll be better in the second year under Jim Schwartz. And I think if they can stay healthier as well, you know, that was a big thing. If you had so many backups out there by the end of the season that, Stuff like that's bound to happen. Yeah, relative to your um, your comment about the the big place, Jim Schwartz referred to it as the cost of doing business, the way they do things. Um, and, and you know what? You, 
yeah, if if you're going to be in second and 12 and third and eight and third and nine, you live with the occasional, you know, 10, 12 yard run. And there's nothing more frustrating uh, than watching a team just get nickel and dime to death. Uh, when your defense is just constantly giving up first down after first down, I'd rather see the occasional big play, but yet have an explosive defense that can turn the ball over, that can force the three and outs. Um, so you know, I think Jim Schwartz nailed it. That's the price of doing business. And I, would, I think, you know, pretty much any Browns fan is going to prefer that. I saw with, uh, with Joe Woods for all those years. Yeah, without question. The, you know, the, the defense um, definitely took a step up. And, and again, I, I expect him to, to be better in year two. Randy Gersley from Dog Pound Daily and I are going to step aside, take a quick timeout, other side of the break. Turn our attention to the upcoming draft just a couple of weeks away now. Sports for CLE talking NFL draft when we return. Stay with us. Maximum millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. We continue talking Browns with Randy Gersey from Dog Pound Daily. This one from Yahoo Sports. It's every team's need level for wide receiver in the upcoming NFL draft. Teams with little to no need, they say the Browns. Browns have spent many draft picks to get rookies and veterans into the building the last few years. While it's unclear if there's a true number two wide out on the roster, the group of Elijah Moore, Jerry Judy, David Bell, and Cedric Tillman presents plenty of depth and some positional versatility. Uh, Randy, that's probably fair. Having said that, you know, that the, they extended out Judy, so they have Jerry Judy. Elijah Moore's not under contract next season. Mark Cooper really isn't. Um, David Bell and Tillman haven't done what you really want to see from them just yet. There's still time, don't get me wrong. But the wide receiver position – we did this a little earlier in the week. The Browns have spent less draft capital at wide receiver. Um, there have only been, I think, six other teams that have spent less over the past 10 years. Yeah, and you look at their top three picks, and they're all guys that they traded for, uh, or, or the top three receivers. I mean, they're, they're, you got a Cooper, you Moore, um, Jerry, uh, Jerry Judy. They're all guys that they went out and traded for. That's probably been the real knock that I have on Andrew Barry. Um, you know, overall, he's done an absolutely phenomenal job. So, you know, don't take that the wrong way. But he, he has struggled to get that wide receiver. And it may be that he's waiting until round three to start drafting them. Um, you know, David Bell showed a little bit of progress last year, but wasn't consistent. Cedric Tillman would, same thing, kind of every now and then you would really see the flashes, but then he would just disappear for a while. So they've been struggling to get that guy that's going to be long term. And, uh, but I, I know that they don't seem to have a need this year, but they're definitely kicking the tires on a lot of guys. I know they, Met with uh, Malachi Corley, uh, met with Troy Franklin, they met with Ladd McConkey. So they're looking for wide receivers. Um, probably don't have the intention of extending both Cooper and Moore, but just trying to give themselves some options there. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the other thing is, even, you know, you go back to, I think it's 2010, one first round pick on a wide receiver, it was Corey Coleman. Two second round picks, Greg Little, and then we're going to count Josh Gordon in the supplemental because they took him in the second round of the supplemental draft. After that, it's third round and below, and that you, you can't do that in the in the NFL. And, and if you look back and you want to know why the Browns have struggled as a franchise, it's passing league, and you haven't identified your quarterback, and you haven't gotten a wide receiver. Yeah, you haven't developed wide receivers. Yeah. And they really lucked out with Amari Cooper that Dallas decided to just dump him for practically nothing um, because he's really been the, he's been the best receiver that they've had since coming back in 99. I mean, he's the first guy to go back-to-back 1,000-yard season. So you think they really lucked out with him. I was hoping for more from Elijah Moore, maybe with Sean Watson hopefully being healthy for the entire season. We could see something different. Um, I have – you know, high expectations for Jerry Judy. I think that he fits uh, Kevin Zabansky's offense 
But yeah, if they're if they're going to want to get draft a receiver, have a younger receiver in there, somebody that's not making twenty million dollars a year, they're going to have to use that uh, second round pick, and they may even need to trade up if they want to get somebody that's you know going to be a sure thing. All right, this one from uh, Ryan McChrystal from Sharp Football Analysis: Top draft pick predictions, best targets in the uh, twenty twenty four NFL Draft. Browns top draft prediction: Chris Jenkins, defensive tackle, Michigan, best targets. Uh, defensive tackle, Brown's interior defensive linemen are 32. That's Shelby Harris, 31. Quentin Jefferson, 30. Uh, Delvin Tomlinson, clearly the unit needs some youth. Chris Jenkins would help uh, the run defense. Florida State's Braden Fisk could give a boost to the interior pass rush. Cornerback, though not an immediate need, Greg Newsom is entering the final year of his contract. Browns are in a tight cap situation, so an extension is not likely. Iowa's TJ Tampa and Rutgers' Max Melton are potential targets. Targets, running back, improving the backfield depth, potentially adding uh, Chubb's replacement, should be one of Cleveland's top priorities. Jonathan Brooks, Florida State's Trey Benson, offer similar balanced skill sets to Chubb's. All right, um, I, I get where they're going with defensive tackle. Um, I don't know that that you necessarily need to take a defensive tackle in the second round. I guess is where I'm at with that. I would agree with you. I like uh, the guys they mentioned, uh, but I think, you know, you have Maurice Harris. He's on a one-year deal. Uh, Shelby Harris uh, is on a two-year deal. Dalvin Tomlinson still has two more years. So I don't – and neither one of them really showed signs of slowing down. They were both great last year. Shelby Harris really came on strong at the end of the season. Uh, they still hope that Siaki Ica can come in and, and give them some help on run defense. He didn't get to play a lot last year, uh, so maybe if he showed some progress. But yeah, I don't think that you're going to be seeing a defensive tackle in the second round. Um, I, they – the Browns kind of showed their cards. I know they like to keep being close to their best, but they've been really kicking the tires on uh, wide receivers and offensive tackles. So I kind of feel like that's where you're going to see them go when they're on the clock around two. Yeah, and I would uh, I would tend to agree. And, you know, I, I was negative. I, I Initially I said, ah, there's no way they're going to take a, a running back. If a guy is sitting there and they, value, they have like a – you know, say Trey Benson is there, and they say he's a second, you know, a high, high second, low first round grade. I could see them taking a running back just because you're not exactly sure what Nick Chubb's going to be. They've they've said as much, and you're still going to run the football in this offense. Yeah, and you're ideally Nick Chubb's going to come back and be Nick Chubb, but you know. If we're going to be realistic here, running backs unfortunately have the shortest shelf life. So he's already, you know, getting closer to the, to his late twenties, and now has a second knee injury. So yeah, if there's a good value pick, uh, the, I can see them taking it as well. I don't think that they're going to reach for anybody. I don't think that they're going and they're targeting running backs. I think that you know with Deontay Foreman, Naheem Hines being signed and bringing Chubb back this year, I think they feel good about what they have and they know they can get through the year. But I think you you hit the nail on the head. Trey Benson sitting there in round three. It's going to be kind of hard to pass somebody like that up. All right. Uh, this is from Nick Baumgartner, um, his mock draft for the Athletic. So at 54, he has the Browns taken wide receiver Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky at long last. Uh, Browns will back, back in the uh, first round next year. Meantime, they'll have an option to take advantage of this receiving class at 54. Um, they could take the next best offensive tackle, as we talked about. Value extends beyond pass catching. Yard after catch makes him a possible run game factor, too. Um, then at 85, we have him come, coming back, taking an offensive lineman, uh, Dominic Pooney uh, from Kansas. And, and Pooney's a guy that I've seen a couple people mock um, to the Browns. Let's start with Corley. Um, again, if Corley's sitting there at 54, he is a guy that, they don't have that particular big-bodied run-after-the-catch skill set in their wide receiver room. And, and that's what you're, you're looking for, guys, that are – it's almost like a puzzle piece. We don't quite have that. Let's get that. And, and that way you plug in different skill sets. Yeah, and I like Corley a lot. Um, he's a guy that forces a lot of missed tackles. I'm um, looking at his stats here. and He had 330 yards off of screen passes, uh, forced 15 missed tackles. You know, we know Kevin Stefanski loves a screen pass. Um, so he kind of fits in there. He's been compared to Debo Samuel. He's kind of that turns into a running back after the catch type of a player. So I think he would be an excellent pick. And I like how they said, you know, at long last next year, we're going to be back in the first round for the Browns. But this year, if they don't trade, we're going to be back in the second round for the first time in a few years. So I'm getting excited, hoping that they're going to keep that pick and actually finally take a second rounder. And I'd be thrilled if it was Corley. 
Yeah, do, do you like the idea of coming back and getting a lineman then in, in Pooney? Um, yeah, and I think that this is a good year to target a lineman. Uh, you don't have to go early. I think you know there's certain guys that could fall to them in the second round. Um, Amagaji's a good one. Um, Kinsu Samatulia um, is pretty good. Uh, hopefully, I didn't butcher their name. Uh, I think both of them could be good second round picks, but you get other guys. Uh, Pooney's a good one. Uh, Patrick Paul in the third round. I think guys like that are normally wouldn't be there in round three in other drafts, but this this year it's pretty low to the offensive tackle, so I think that they could get a guy in the third round that you can try to develop behind Jedrick Wills and replace him next year. Randy Gersey, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Randy. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Randy Gersey, make sure you check him out. Always really good stuff uh, with Dog Pound Daily. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We will see you back here Monday at 4 o'clock. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you Monday at 4 on Sports for CLE.